Hi, I'm Martin Sibley, a community leader at Open Inclusion. Welcome to our podcast series, Inclusive Design, Broader Perspectives for Better Experiences, also available as a caption podcast on Open Inclusion's YouTube channel. Open Inclusion is a research, user insight, design and innovation consultancy based in London, England. We help organisations create beautifully inclusive and effective experiences. If you would like to know more about the work we do or would like to contact us, please visit openinclusion.com. We would love to hear from you. In this podcast series, we're interviewing a wide range of people who help us better understand inclusion, both from a user and service provider perspective. In this episode, we're gonna be exploring the world of transport. We have two amazing guests, David Baines and Joseph Giacomin, and they're very much experts in human-centered design, which is right up the street of us at Open Inclusion. And really what I'm hoping to explore in the conversation with my two amazing guests today is how with transport, it's been such a uh, exclusive, excluding area for many disabled people in the past, but with the emergence of new technologies coming in like drones and autonomous vehicles and many other amazing things we're going to be exploring in this episode. If disabled people are including in the design phase, it could be very liberating and empowering with this new type of transport. But if we're not included in the design phase, we could be more excluded than ever. So I hope you enjoy the exploration and journey into transport. So I'm really excited to chat today with David Baines. Thanks for, for joining us. I believe you're in Milton Keynes, is that right, David? I am, yeah. Uh, unusually, I'm at home in Milton Keynes. Uh, so yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to talk to you, Martin. And likewise, and I was fascinated about the story you were just telling me about the, the, the delivery of groceries from, did you say it was like robots that are going yeah, on? Yeah, it, it, you know, it's interesting when uh, you're thinking about innovation and potential impact. So yeah, there's a scheme here in Milton Keynes where there's little robots um, which trundle along our cycle paths uh, called the Redways, delivering basic groceries to people. And if people are interested, you, you'll find it on things like the BBC and Guardian website, little videos of these things. Brilliant. Um, well, I mean, that sets the scene nicely for our conversation about travel and transport and absolutely. how we have applications for mobility and disabled people. Before we, before we get stuck in, be great for the listeners and the watchers if you just give a little introduction as well to yourself. Yeah, so um, so my background is originally I, I trained as a teacher of children with special needs. Okay. Um, worked for that for a number of years uh, before I, I, I became rather more interested in the potential of technology uh, and changing lives for people with disabilities. I have a brother with cerebral palsy, so it's always been an area of interest for me. Um, and then uh, I, I, I took a, a career change uh, and joined AbilityNet uh, in, in 2000 or so. And then in 2009, I was speaking at a conference uh, and a, a lady came up to me and, and said that they were looking at setting up an assistive technology center in Qatar. Uh, would I go across and just give them a little bit of advice for four days um, just to, to see what they were doing? And I ended up staying there nearly seven years. Um, and then I came home uh, in 2016 and set myself up as a consultant. And most of my work now is around technology, innovation, low and medium income countries, but also, but more importantly, about how that is applied. How do we make use of innovation uh, to benefit the broadest parts of society? Yeah, it's brilliant and fascinating work. I'm sure that the, the journeys both uh, around the world you've had, but in terms of learning and, and being able to bring different products and solutions to people must have been amazing. Yeah, and it's been yeah, we're talking about travel and transport today. And one of the things that's interesting is sitting in airports, um, watching some of the challenges that people experience, because you can see them when you're looking for it. Um, what's, what's frustrating is how little you can do about it mm. and how things that are good intention have negative impacts. So in airports, the increased use of silent spaces and lack of announcements uh, creates problems for people if they struggle with getting visual information. Yeah, no, and I think there's a few questions I've got lined up for you today. And I think um, 
we might as well start off with the work you've done internationally as you've touched upon it mm. in your introduction so and obviously there's you know i think people that are going to be tuning in if that's the thing we do with podcasts um are going to you know be more familiar with the developed world inverted commas and 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 some of the barriers and the the solutions and we're definitely going to get stuck into some of the emerging technologies in a minute but yeah it'd be great just to have a bit of an insight in to, to some of the challenges you've seen in less developed countries but particularly some of the solutions that you've come across as well to that yeah i mean it this it's a real mixture as you as you travel to different places so um one of the interesting things is that as locations resorts tourist locations become more and more accessible so more and more people want to travel to them and i think in itself that volume of people with a range of needs wanting to travel brings with itself its own problems um, in the the services are not well established to be fully inclusive so they've always been established on the basis of certain numbers of people wanting to use services at certain times so that is one problem but i think the biggest problem when you travel to different parts of the world is it's almost the the parts of the journey that are difficult to plan so the idea of getting from the airport to your hotel okay you may be able to book an, a, a taxi but then when you get there you find out that actually there's very limited uh, sidewalk spaces so you get out of the taxi and find out that your wheelchair can't actually move anywhere to get you into the into the hotel itself so i was in nairobi recently and the one thing which really struck me was even if you provided good quality wheelchairs for people for personal mobility, many, many parts of the city were almost inaccessible for wheelchair users because the environment wasn't accessible. So I think when we talk about innovation and transport and travel, understanding that relationship between the physical environment, the information environment, and the technologies that we can make available uh, is quite important because just applying technology without understanding context tends not to work very well. Yeah, so I'm thinking about the the beyond. I suppose in a way it's beyond disability as well. That how some of the the new techs that we're going to come on to are able to be solutions to to broader problems as well. And I was thinking around the monsoons in Pakistan. Yeah. Is, it, is, it, is there a, have you, is, I think there's an example you had about that, wasn't there? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that we, we looked at, um, I was in Bangladesh and we began to have a discussion um, around delivery of drugs um, to, to villages. In Bangladesh, in the villages, uh, flooding is a, is a big issue. Um, and we were talking on one side uh, of a lake in a village. And they're explaining to me that the hospital where the drugs are delivered from, we could almost see across the lake. But actually getting round to that hospital, um, a combination of the weather conditions, the climate, and actually the very poor roads could take hours. So going to pick up your drugs that you, you might need could take eight, nine hours a day. And the idea was, was quite firm about the idea of flying drugs across the lake using drones so with a coded secure system so when it landed in the village somebody could undo it take the tablets drugs out whatever was needed the medication and give it to the person and it could fly back um, and think about how some of those technologies could have that benefit overcoming the infrastructure problems yeah. by simply saying well how can we ignore the infrastructure for this purpose yeah. it doesn't solve other problems but it might serve an immediate and quite urgent problem and do you, um, do you think that the drones i guess even bringing it back to, to other all parts of the world what what kind of ways do you think drones could overcome barriers for disabled people i think i mean anything which uh makes life that little bit easier we don't want to be in a position at any time where we're denying people the right to travel um but people will say to me that you know it's a little bit like uh, home delivery of uh, groceries here in the UK. Yeah, we have the right to go to the supermarket. The supermarket is accessible, but you know what? I don't really always want to go to the supermarket. But for someone with a disability, not to have to go through all the problems of planning to go to the supermarket, 
So anything which actually resolves those issues in a way that people feel is valuable is important. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot, that's something which is quite interesting in many areas. We talk about universal design and universal design is incredibly important. But we also talk about alternative formats and alternative formats are important. Yeah, no, when you're saying that, I'm hearing that sentiment around we all as people, as consumers, want that path of least resistance and it's all about our priorities as well so if someone's priority is they just love a day out at the supermarket as you say that you already caveated that that's still a right that should be withheld but actually you know people are more interested in being with the family and doing a job and a career that's fulfilling and helping other people through those endeavors and so if getting the food from the supermarket isn't the top priority, then it's amazing if there's a, a path to least resistance. And then couple that with how, when we design for everybody, like you look at things like Siri on, on the Apple phone, it was more designed with um, type different you know, people with different impairments actually. But in the end, the mainstream Joe Bloggs consumer uses Siri because it's easier and it's that path of least resistance as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, that, that that's, you know, things that make life easier for everyone tend to have benefits for people with disability. Yeah, exactly. So we've, we've touched upon uh, the drones. I know it was um, definitely one thing that sort of, kind of well, well, I suppose with drones, would you say they're here now or is it something that's sort of just in the, the short term on their way? Um, I think the drones are here now. Yeah, we see about it in the news with shutting down Heathrow. And we do, like yeah. And you know, and like many things, that's perhaps not the most positive use of drones. No. Uh, and certainly not, maybe not helpful in supporting travel and transport. No. And that's another issue to look at later on. But I think, it, yeah, they're here. I think what we haven't yet got is um, systematic use of these. These are new technologies. I think we're still learning uh, about how we apply these creatively to support uh, and address real world challenges. Um, but I don't think there's any reason why they can't be used in that way. They've been tested in that way. But whether or not policy um, and whether or not public policy and institutions are ready to use this type of technology yet is a completely different issue. Yeah, yeah. As you say, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to the, the challenges, I think, in a moment. But yeah, it'd be great to hear some more other emerging technologies that you're aware of and excited about for travel and transport yeah and i think often um it's not always about big new things there's some small things that happen that make life quite uh make life easier so i mean i think one of the things that i always found really interesting was when uber came into the market mm. now there was lots of concerns and rightly so about the availability of wheelchair accessible vehicles on uber but having said that, there were many, many other people with disabilities who found that this unlocked access to uh, taxis and transport uh, in quite a big way. Mm. So one of the big things, obviously, was for people who were deaf, not having to call a call centre, hope that there was a text system that they could use if they couldn't speak, uh, if, they couldn't, uh, uh, if they couldn't be heard clearly, um, was, was, was a big advantage. Similarly, for people with uh, some degrees of learning disability, not to have to explain where you wanted to go, but to have favourites that you could just pop in, mm. not to have to explain where you were, but just say, come and pick me up from here. And then even for other people, um, people who, who could mobility issue, knowing that the car that they wanted was seven minutes away and thinking, right, I need to be ready, down at the door, for when the car arrives, uh, was again really advantageous. It, it just meant that I know exactly how much time I've got. I will order it when I'm almost ready. And then the car will be here in a few minutes. The other one which I've been looking at more recently, which is uh, I was talking to somebody about, uh, and they were talking about whether or not in uh, multi-story car parks and other parking spaces, how they could potentially use the same technology that blocks off pedestrianized areas to protect blue badge spaces so that basically you had a near field communicator it could be you're on your phone or whatever in your car 
when you got close to the space, if you were eligible to use it, because you had a blue badge, the little plates that stop cars going in would lower automatically and open the space up for you. Mm. So we get away from this problem of people parking across spaces, all the arguments and pressure about, you know, invisible disability, should you be allowed to use this space and so on and so on. Because actually, if you've got the communicator, if you've got the right, it will open up the space for you. Yeah. Um, so I think applying those types of technology, protecting the space that people need, um, would also be really useful. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot there about smart cities, isn't there? You know, we, we sort of think, of, well, I, well, I suppose I think more because of my background of being disabled and working in the disability space, looking at sort of driverless cars and what that might open yeah. up. But th there's a big <clears throat> movement around smart cities that, that is not led by accessibility, but it has the power to potentially open up a lot of metaphorical doors for disabled people. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the this, this smart, smart, smart cities <laughs> um, approach is, is an interesting one. I don't think we've really thought creatively about how the technology supports people with disabilities in smart cities. The use of data uh, to support planning. One of the things that I saw, which was I thought was really nice, um, so Google's uh, Google Maps now has an AR function built in, mm. uh, augmented reality function. So what we can now do is, I was in Bologna using it recently, rather than trying to follow the map, we can hold the phone up, look through it, see the city and the location, orientate ourselves, and a line is drawn along the route we should take so it's very easy to follow that route uh, in real time and you could see how that sort of support for mobility uh, for people who maybe find reading maps difficult uh, i'm probably one of them um, would actually be really valuable especially where it's giving information about what's going on around you as well mm -hmm. so oh, i think uh, yeah smart cities is, are, are really important and transport within cities and into cities from airports train stations and so on uh, could be made easier by better use of information. Yeah, sounds good. So before we move on to the challenges, is there any other um, sort of just to mention any other areas you'd like to share with the listeners? I think there's two areas which are, are really quite interesting at the moment. I think everybody's thinking about autonomous vehicles yeah. uh, and semi-autonomous vehicles. I think we're all quite excited about the possibility. But I was really interested to see the work that's being done about taking that technology and applying it to wheelchair design, powered yeah. wheelchair design. People like Toyota and others are really taking that idea on. Um, and of course, there's, a, there's a, a, a quite a, a lot more safety in uh, driving a wheelchair along a pathway than driving a, a car at 70 miles an hour uh, in terms of just how much damage you can do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think wheelchair design and personal mobility particularly where you can override. Um, so, you know, if, you've, if, the, if your power chair is taking you a certain amount of time, but the fine details you can still control yourself if you need to. Yeah. Um, is is but, really interesting. And, and using those in built environments. So, sorry, Tinto, I was going to say that the big application for me personally is in the winter, I get really cold. And when I'm cold, I struggle to drive my wheelchair. So that sort of stuff would be, would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I can see that. That's, that's a great example. Um, so yeah, that, and and of course, if you can link that up with route finding, so it's taking you the most accessible route as well. You don't have that frustration of realizing you've you've gone the wrong way. Yeah. So that, I think that's that, one that opens up the the pub. You can go to the pub and have as many as you Absolutely. want. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and get home yeah, safely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think this. I think this is probably something many people are crying out for. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, I think the other one, which is interesting but I can see uh, it takes us into some of the challenges. We're seeing a lot of work around things like exoskeletons. Mm. And I equally get, and I, I see the messages coming back from, from activists and people with disabilities saying, we don't need these new technologies. We just need you to build ramps. And I have a, a huge sympathy with that, that actually getting the basics right is important, especially when we talk about low and medium income countries, getting the basics right like not having ramps at 45 degrees would be a good thing for many wheelchair users. But I don't think it's an either or situation. 
that exoskeleton research is not really about people with disabilities. It's about people working in construction. It's about people working in engineering. Some of that technology will transfer potentially to support some people with disabilities. Mm. Uh, and in some situations, it may be a very good answer. So human augmentation is another aspect of personal mobility for the future. I'm a firm believer that we need to innovate, we need to push the barriers back and think, what could we do with these really new technologies? Yeah. But that should never replace the need to get the basics in the environment uh, done as well. Yeah, I know from my sort of activist, um, you know, reading up on it and meeting other people that the, the reason people get a bit wary about the sort of the very precious and quite rightly of the social model. And I think when we look at the medical advancements, there's a lot more of a ethical and moral conundrum about, you know, what what is diversity if we seek to cure people of different conditions but what you and i are talking about today and, and that, that's a really interesting conversation that we should probably have uh, in a pub one day and do a podcast about it but yeah what you're saying is that it technology is a way of overcoming the social model barriers so we either we either pull the barriers down through design and and the sort of recreating the environment or we use technology that enables us to overcome the barriers that are there. And I think in the end, it's back to priorities. People want to live happy and fulfilled lives. And so whatever way works to get over the barriers is right. And I think the really interesting, uh, interesting is that if you put that in a paradigm of human augmentation rather than trying to fix disability, mm. over the coming 10 years, we're going to see far far more things around human augmentation. Um, uh, and we know we have some of these, you know, uh, artificial hips. You've got all these things that are pretty widely accepted now anyway. Yeah. But I think it's going to become a mainstream part of the way in which we uh, look after ourselves is to augment our bodies. And, I know, and it is all very interconnect and there's, there's so many different angles to to talk about it but I think yeah in terms of moving us forward with the interview I think it's uh, the challenges would be really good to touch on and I appreciate all the things we've just talked about um have are going to have different challenges from from drones to drive you know driverless cars but have you got any thoughts on you know thematic challenges I think policy is one that you were going to mention earlier yeah I think um one, one of the big issues is is that policy can't keep up with innovation very well yeah um, and, and that's not helped in a funny way by the desire for evidence-based approaches um, because tests and trials take long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the private sector is actually often quite a bit better at embracing innovation to make it available to you than public, uh, public bodies. So how we help policymakers embrace and explore innovation to reduce cost and, and increase inclusion and access i think is is difficult mm. um so policy making is certainly one area but i think we're also in a really weird period coming up in terms of travel and transport that for the first time for many people with disabilities the barriers are changing the opportunity is there it may not be well implemented but the opportunity to travel widely is actually a possibility, which wasn't available 10, 20 years ago. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. As always, it's, um, you know, we love you to have that, that sort of silver bullet of a solution. And in the end, it's lots of idea sharing, lots of, you know, bringing the right people around the table, lots of iterations. Um, I don't think it's usually the word iteration. We are actually having quite a big leap in innovation and almost revolutionary changes to some degree because of the level of progress in technology. But um, when you sort of look at how it does play out is that just trying to get these ideas out there and get people talking about it so we can gradually try and find that ideal solution. And, and, and this is where, you know, disruption becomes interesting. So, um, you know, Things like Airbnb have offered new ways to accommodate yourself when you travel. 
where you've got people uh, on Airbnb who are uh, wheelchair users themselves, they become quite interesting as spaces to book on the grounds. Well, if you can use that space, I can probably use that space when I book mm, it. Yeah. And similarly for travel with car parking, there's now a number of systems where you can book uh, to use people's driveways uh, or their own personal parking spaces uh, when you go out. So if you know that's within uh, an accessible reach of a location you want to go to, that may actually be a better route because protecting a space mm. for you in an area where you can use it. Yeah. So I think disruptive innovation, travel, transport, accommodation, putting all those strands together mm. is important. But I think probably the most important innovation we need is how we link these together. Yeah. It is that seamless end-to-end -end process that I think people are really looking for because it's, it's what's the weakest link in the chain mm -hmm. that means that travel and transport for, for a person uh, breaks down. As I if anyone watching or listening, it's, I mean, have you got any sort of last thoughts on how they can lend their voice and their energy to try and help this go the right way i think i mean i would i would, I would always start from that approach is you know understanding the real world problem lots mm -hmm. of people um you know lots of people never thought there was an issue with taxes until uber was created lots of people didn't think there was a problem um with uh, photography and film until digital cameras became available I think the really important thing is, is to be creative. What accessibility in travel, transport, in many areas probably wants most at the moment is imagination. Mm. It's about creativity. How can we take all of these strands, Google's augmented reality, with data from public services, with uh, the Waze approach of user-led information, how can we put all of that together, link it up to physical transport methods, autonomous vehicles, semi-autonomous vehicles, uh, and so on, taking us to the places we want to go. It's about joining the dots and being imaginative. I think if we can do that, put engineers together with people with disabilities, together with people uh, who are creative, that's where I'd like to see us go from here. David, that is the perfect note to end the interview on. That was really, really insightful. And thank you for all your time today. You're very welcome always. Right, so I'm joined today by Joseph. I think you're calling him from London at Brunel, is that right, Joseph? Yes, West London, Brunel University, yes. Very nice, very nice. And your, your big background, really, as we're going to tackle into in a moment, is around human-centred design, is that correct? Yes, sir. Started out as an engineer, mechanical engineer, moved into human factors, began to realise that the technology is not... Uh, usually solving the issues people have more and more into psychological sociological and eventually found a home in human-centered design as, as a way of doing innovation as a business model no oh, brilliant i know that there's so many th things i'm excited to talk to you about today i know we were talking before that um the, the, the sort of philosophy you have it really resonated on my disability activism side the the slogan nothing about us without us and I think that's been a way of trying to get more into the conversation on that political level. And I think where you're at and many others like you and open inclusion is also about that in the end, we should be consulting with all types of users, not just disabled, but generally a spectrum of users to make sure that any given product or service is going to have the best utility for, for the punters, as we say. Absolutely. Yes, definitely the, the way we do innovation in society for a long time has been technology push. And we, we come up with clever things and we assume they find a role in people's lives and society to help people. But in a world where half the people have a unique degree, where the internet has led to an explosion of information, you know, we have more things today than all the rest of human history put together we're now in a situation that you do begin to wonder if we're playing God with, with things and doing things. Who's it for? What's it going to do for the people? What's it mean to them? Is it going to be a practical thing to go somewhere, part of a ritual with their children or their parents or their family? 
or is it some sort of a more spiritual, aesthetic, artistic, asking questions about what it means to the people, how they're going to use it. That really needs to be the very first thing that gets done before we ever sit at a meeting and begin discussing what we could do as a business or as a government office or an NGO. It really, yeah. it, we need to flip things around a bit from my point. Yeah. And that's, that's a perfect introduction, because right? obviously the, the topic we're going to look at today is around transport and new technology. But I, I think that's exactly the, the first point to make here, is that when we're entering this brave new world of, of design and engineering and opportunities, it's, well, actually, what's the, the, the purpose or the objective? Who's going to use it? So, I mean, to, to that end, looking into this brave new world of technology, be great to hear your thoughts and insights of some of the technologies that you're aware of that are coming, um, but very much shrouded in your philosophy of the importance of having human-centered design to harness it in the best way possible. Well, I, I think from automotive, I've, I've worked in the industry for the last 25, 30 years, either at car companies or in academia, and it's been very obvious that we've had about a hundred years of incremental innovation. What's interesting about the last few years and the next five or ten is that it's all going to change. Like when we went from a horse to a car, now we're going from a car to an automated chauffeur car. And, you know, so much of our culture for the last hundred years has developed around the motor vehicle and being in control of it and where you go with it, what you do, road rage and psychology. And that's going to change. So we've made a lot of assumptions about you know, how deeply important transport is and, and to actually do things by going there as opposed to worrying about how we do the driving. So I think we're at the cusp of a disruptive innovation as opposed to an incremental. I think we're on the cusp of a major social change in what we read on the Top Gear website or, or I'll see on the BBC News channel and so forth. I think we're going to have different conversations, different priorities. Uh, we're suddenly going to realize that a lot of what we did when we took driving tests and so forth wasn't fun. We, we thought it was fun. But <laughs> we, we did it because we had a greater objective, and it's the greater objective, which can still be reached with these new technologies without all that effort. And I think we're going to see a lot happen. And as the automation gets more sophisticated, we're going to ask deep questions of what we want from our avatar electronic chauffeur. From an inclusive point of view, there's all kinds of levels of inclusivity from the physical to the sensory to the cognitive to the emotional. Which one of these are going to be most best received and most important to the lives of which people? Yeah, it, um, it reminds me of one of my favorite films when I was growing up, Back to the Future. There's a lot of stuff in there that, that's starting to happen, already is happening. I mean, I think one thing that strikes me of what you're saying there is well, when we think of inclusivity with products and particularly with transport, there's a lot around the, the physical design and, and the sort of infrastructural elements. But not, not just for wheelchair users, I think that's applicable to other impairments too. But when we're talking about this machine that, as you say, becomes more like a chauffeur, and we're teaching this AI how to, to sort of what, what its boundaries and what its learning limits may or may not be, um, I think that that's an astounding um, you know, conundrum almost. Of, I remember reading the other day about if, if the car is faced with um, almost having to save the pedestrians but it might end up resulting in the, the owner of the vehicle dying in such an accident. There's this real moral uh, level that, that we have to think about. And so I suppose all of this is to say on that, that general moral level and on that inclusivity level that we're very focused on today, are, are these discussions already taking place? Are they, are they coming up in the near future? Where, where is the planning and design phase of this at the moment? I, I think there's more and more of that coming through, but like all human endeavors, you know, we have the Maslow Triangle. Usually you start out with physical needs and then there's more comfort and enjoyment and safety and quality. 
and then you move up to the more interaction, psychological, sociological, and eventually at the very top, the deep meaning of the thing. I think so much of the debate around inclusion, inclusivity, and inclusive design still today is very driven by the physical, because for a long, long time we've known the general principles that we could be applied, but we've struggled to do it. The platforms of most train stations are not appropriate, and many TFL stations don't even have elevators to this day. But I think it's dawning on people very quickly that with the richness and the technology and the amount of money businesses have and people have, with the, with the, with the lifestyle we have today, with a bit of organization, a bit of push, we should be able to resolve a lot of those, but then we're still left with a very new proposition that needs looking at, something we really don't have the guidance and the guidelines and the standards in place, which is if the machine is semi-autonomous, autonomous, semi-sentient, if, if occasionally we mistake it for a living creature, what behavior would we accept from it? Yeah, it's interesting from an entrepreneurial business perspective that you could see a lot of different ways it would play out. You know, you'd almost have your Uber and your taxi version of this that would be very different brands to, to, to simplify. Um, I mean, I, I suppose, so if I was to say, oh, and I've got this idea of an application for this type of transport that um, I'm a wheelchair user, so I would like it to be accessible, um, in terms of the physical infrastructure, that it's the dimensions are big enough for a wheelchair, and my upper body is weaker, so I would like it that it was able to be intelligent enough to know, um, you know, to help me open the doors and um, to do that kind of accessing mm. of the vehicle. Um, my fiance is originally from Poland, so we go on long drives once a year to Poland that are just exhausting. So maybe this new way of transport would you know, not only not have to do all the driving, but potentially I could even get out of my wheelchair if there was certain equipment like a hoist or whatever it might be. So if I was to want to float that with the people that are designing and leading on this, who are they? Like, how would I try and begin to feed in my personal customer experiences to this picture? Well, I, per I mean, no one has a crystal ball that can really be very accurate about predicting the future. Personally, as myself, as an individual, my, my thoughts on, on this particular issue are, I think it's very likely in, in the rather rich and luxurious age in which we're in, that there's going to be probably an ecosystem for a large number of solutions. And this number, as you mentioned with the word brand, I think there will be different entrepreneurs with different thoughts about what's appropriate. And I think there'll be a variety. I think if we look at the assistive technologies themselves, such as you mentioned the wheelchair, if we look at the wheelchair and just strip it out from the whole inclusive experience and just look at it as, a, as an artifact from a design perspective, we can see a trajectory there, which is typical of most consumer goods as well or services, which initially rather functional, um, cost implications quite strong in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, then in more recent times, a more experienced comfort achieved by the 70s, 90s, and then more an experience base. And we're at the point today where there's some very high tech offerings. I, I think as the wheelchair itself has manifested recently in so many different variants for so many different people with different interests, I think very quickly, the autonomous vehicle as the big wheelchair, if we wish to make that sort of metaphor as a reference point for discussion, I think that it will be a similar situation. There will be the very basic transport needs, and then there will be vehicles which will get you to the Royal Albert Hall 20 minutes before the proms, looking very posh, looking very sharp in your tuxedo and so forth. I think there will be those vehicles and those wheelchairs and those technologies for those events where a certain aesthetic or a manner of presenting might be a bit more important to the person on the night in that scenario. Yeah, that was uh, beautifully explained, Joseph, and very, very helpful to, to sort of piece all the different moving parts together. 
So I mean, I suppose to, to finish us off, really look into the future. I mean, I think we've we've touched on it to a certain degree, but what what kind of things would you like to see happening and done to ensure we do end up where this ecosystem of transport services are inclusive? Is it, are there any kind of particular research that is going to be happening or you would like to see happening in terms of um, making sure that the, the purple pound, as it's become known, is going to be seen and, and understood by those future entrepreneurs and leaders? Um, that's a question, the one you're asking, that, that's been, I've had to think about many, many times because in the <laughs> design sector, there's so many uh, approaches and so many priorities a person could work towards. And I have to admit, um, my background is from an engineering and scientific background 20, 30 years ago. I was writing journal papers for academic publications on neural networks related to automobiles and transport systems back in the 1980s. And having seen over this period since then where we've gone with expert systems, neural networks, brain simulate, with cognitive science, neuroscience, medicine, you know, it's hard not to feel that the technical bit, the science bit, will be sorted. So having said that, assuming the science bit at some point will almost certainly be sorted, because humans are creative, they're intelligent, they're clever, and they will get it done eventually, then the problem becomes a slightly different one, which is how we know we'll get it to work for people, and how we know it's going to be inclusive. And there we come back to human-centered design, putting the punter at the center of everything, making sure the innovation model starts with looking at what the customer perceives and sees value in, understanding how much that's worth to the person, and allocating resources appropriately from that starting point to get where we want to go. But if there's one uh, danger or one risk that could foul everything up is our difficulty in imagining the future. The Star Wars fan, they've immersed themselves in that future so well that they can design, they can choose, they can say what they like, they don't like almost perfectly with 100% accuracy. You take a punter off the street, you ask a question about an autonomous vehicle, what are we supposed to answer? So there's a real question of, as things speed away from us, how are we going to prospect four or five or ten possibilities and immerse the people enough to work with the punters so we get it right the first time, considering the cost in there. You know, a lot of the politics at the moment, we're in a generation of people haven't lived through wars, and, and you can see that, you know, it's really hard for them to completely, totally understand some of the implications, some of the decisions, because you know, it never happened to them. And in design, with something like inclus inclusion, Imagining another being in another person's shoes when the other person has characteristics which differ substantially from you in some aspect. That's almost impossible for most people. They really struggle. And then to do that 20 years in the future, when we're all old men, you know, it, it's really hard. And, and as designers, this is a real problem because, you know, you can react to what people say and do. You know, you can put people at the center of your innovation process as much as you want. But you are relying on the fact that what they're saying to you is really helpful. And what if they're misunderstanding it? Because they never, they never had that experience. Yeah. And they're not going to really... tell you that they're saying rubbish because that's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there's a really interesting article I've been reading um, on a website called Wait But Why by mm. an author called Tim Urban. And then there's all sorts of um, parts of the article that are fascinating. I really recommend you and any of the, the listeners as well to, to check it out. But it, a big part of it was about how um, we, we're trying to change norms. And as you're sort of saying, imagining that future. And I think that there's very few that, that actually grasp what the, the truth and what the right way, well, I say truth in a very um, almost cliche way, but it's sort of what the right way should be. And for a long while, they're the outliers and the misfits. And it's a little bit to quote Steve Jobs as well, that it's about how in the end, we're trying to move the conversation from those few that can really see a world that, that would be great for everyone. And they're seen as a bit crazy and a bit weird. 
but then gradually bringing the masses on board with that. And it's interesting when you talked about science fiction, that that's always been a very powerful tool of how we've brought people on that journey from something very unfamiliar to familiar. So, yeah, it kind of feels that there's a lot of talk about disability in the media, and that's played out a little bit more as presenters and on documentaries. But it would be great to see a wave of fiction, you know, books and sci-fi films that partly have disabled characters from my perspective of disability, but also, as you're saying, generally show these many different applications of how transport will look in a positive, optimistic way, not, oh my God, we're all going to be killed by AI kind of way. It, 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 it's always the same trajectory. In inclusive design, for many years now, they've had goggles or glasses which limit the person's vision, they've had simulations of pregnancy, they've had various suits which make your muscles loaded, so simulating muscle weaknesses or difficulties with articulation. So like everything else, we've started trying to put a small number of people really into situations so they can try to empathize and understand better how another colleague might have a difficulty. But but again, the, the things were physical. Then recently, you know, whether it's the television or the BBC or the internet, we're trying to say, you know, look, these are real people. If you never see them on the telly, are you surprised that people don't really know how to interact with people properly? So we've moved more to the sensory and the cognitive. But then if we take time, you know, because, you know, our universe is four dimensions, you know, it's three spatial and and the big unknown, the time, which designers very rarely deal with in an adequate manner. If we take time and say, yes, but that's the way you feel, or that's the way you might react to the television sitcom today, mm -hmm. but what might your mates and your, what your children, for example, what, how might they react to a similar situation in 30 years, 20 years time? There, we really, we, we, we're not even scratching the surface at the moment of that sort of thinking. If something like environmental change, which is in the public imagination quite a big thing, and quite scary, if that is a struggle to engage with thinking of yourself, your future self in 20, 30 years time, think about so many other life experiences which maybe aren't, aren't as scary or aren't as high up the priority list for the average person as that might be. And I think inclusion, is one of those areas. We all want it, we all think it's a good thing, but for many people it's not, you know, a daily top priority in their life. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm going to out myself as, as an optimist if that wasn't already apparent and a, and a bit of a marketer. My, my master's was in marketing, but my, my hope with, from what you were saying is I, I think the sustainable, the green movement has brought about a generation of consumers that don't just want functional products, they want businesses and brands with values. And so my hope is that that will continue. And so the inclusion agenda will become part of what the mass market demand from the companies that they buy from. And that might be the, the key to inclusion. But you're absolutely right at the moment with the current you know, marketplace it, it people don't disagree with it but it's not urgent or scary enough to to truly embrace and so yeah i think that there's a lot through the media and through marketing that can make this more positive um but it, but it's uh, partly i suppose about trying to paint a picture of the future that people decide is the social norm that we should adhere to rather than mirroring those that we have now well i have to admit in my case, personally, I'm, I'm, I tend to be perhaps slightly more pessimistic than, than, than you are. However, I think in, in this case, on this topic, we're both in agreement because I take another point of view. I just look at it as human populations increasing, human mobility is increasing. You know, so there's more people and they're moving around more and meeting more people. And thanks to the internet and social media, we have even more contact. It, it's an exponential multiplier of contact. As people contact people, 
things start to become more obvious and people become more aware. We've never had a time where there's more people or more travel or more social interaction. And it just seems to me, no matter how pessimistic a person is, the more you meet and depend on your neighbor, the more you're going to get to understand them, whether you like it or not. And hopefully that's going to produce some changes. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Well, listen, Joseph, I, I think we could talk all day long about this. It's so fascinating, the, the many different angles just feeding into transport and inclusivity. It's been a really fascinating chat. Is, is there anything you'd like to finish off with saying or how people can follow up if they have any other questions or thoughts for you? The follow up, um, you know, people, you know, please do connect on LinkedIn. Please do contact me if there's anything about human centered design. We're always keen to try to be helpful and to discuss, and that's our passion. I think what we see is the role of human centered design and putting the hunter in the driver's seat, to pardon the pun. I think that's probably come across in what I've been saying and you know, the basic ideas, I think I've probably put them across in one way or another discussion. So I don't wish to add anything, but please do contact us. These things are happening and the world of design is changing and the benefits for inclusivity and inclusion are potentially enormous. So if we can just get the punters at the heart of business innovation and government innovation. And I think it's happening, but the more of us are trying it, the better. Brilliant. Well, thank you for your time today. No, thank you so much for the invitation. It's extremely kind.